Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. So at the end of last year, I reviewed six different Cabernet Sauvignons from Chile. To start off this year, I'm going to review eight different Sauvignon Blancs from Chile. This is a free sample provided to me and I have no restrictions on how to review it. If you want to get a more detailed explanation of Chilean wine, then check out my first episode of the Cab series, episode 99, about the Miguel Torres Corriera de las Cabernet Sauvignon. The link will be below in the description. This is the eighth and last wine in the series. Whew, this wine comes from the Ventisquero Wine Estates. Let's get their background. So there's really not much here, at least in knowing anything other than some names, especially if you're not familiar with the movers and shakers of Chilean business. So it involves Gonzalo Vial Vial somehow. He is the founder of Agro Super, a holding company that specialized in chicken at first and then got into the salmon business. His involvement is unknown other than the website saying he wanted to launch a winery and then nothing else is mentioned. Then we have Martin Silva and Eduardo Silva along with the only name that I know of, that I have any knowledge of, Aurelio Montes, getting together in 1996 to look for some land to plant a vineyard. Aurelio Montes, you may remember, is the founder of Montes Wines. I couldn't find anything about Martin and Eduardo Silva. There is a Garces Silva winery and the Casas Silva winery, but neither seem to be connected to these, to these gentlemen as far as I know. I'm moving on. In 1998, the trio planted their first vines. It becomes the Trinidad Vineyard in the Maipo Valley, and the winery is built on this property. The original name was Vina Lo Miranda, then it changed to uh, Vina Vial. Not sure the reasons for either name, but obviously the second name has something to do with Gonzalo Vial Vial. Maybe that's when he got involved with the business. In 1999, they changed the name one more time to Vina Ventisquero, uh, which it pays homage to the glaciers in the Chilean Patagonia. The name directly translates to snowdrift in English, so it kind of makes sense, right? Next, we have Felipe Tosso coming into the picture as the chief winemaker in 2000 and the release of their first wines in 2001. We know more about him via the website. He has visited and worked in several wine regions around the world. He's also a descendant of the Conchiatoro winemaking tree, having worked there prior to Ventisquero. After that, John Duval comes on board as a consultant. Now, he has his own winery in Australia, and prior to that, he was the chief winemaker at Penfolds for many years. In 2020, the name of the winery changed one more time to Ventisquero Wine Estates. Backtracking just a bit, the vines for this wine were planted in what would become the Longomia Vineyard in its namesake's town in the Huascodillo in the Atacama Desert. This is the farthest area north for viticulture in Chile. Unsure the exact year. They say they planted their first vines in 2008, but the uh, Nicolasa Vineyard page says it was planted in 2010, and then the other vineyard in the Atacama Valley was planted in 2012. Anyway. They own seven vineyards in total. I found most of them, but a couple have eluded me. The vineyard for this wine was tricky as it shares a picture with the Nicolasa vineyard that's several miles to the east, but I got it figured out, I think. This vineyard is about 32 kilometers or 20 miles from the Pacific Ocean. Now, super close to the ocean, but the vineyard is right on the banks of the Huasco River Basin that empties into the ocean, so that cool ocean air should be making its way to the vineyard. Temperatures range from an average of about 7 degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter uh, to 27 degrees Celsius or 81 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. The vineyard is 9.82 hectares and was planted in 2012. You can find Merlot, Syrah, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon Blanc here. They use drip irrigation with the Huasco River as its source. The training system is vertical shoot positioning, aka VSP, and the yield is around five to six tons per hectare. Soils are composed of sandy loam and are stony at the surface. They are alluvial in origin. 70% sand in the first top layer of the soil. 
slightly alkaline with a calcareous matrix farther down. The profile is very porous because of the stones and sand in the soil. The pH of the soil is 7.5 to 8.0 with very little organic matter. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. There's going to be some wine geeks out there that that means a lot to. It rains very little here being in a desert. Average rainfall is 45 millimeters or 1.8 inches, with most of it coming in the fall and winter months between May and August. Though the tech sheet says it hasn't rained for 50 years in the area. <laughs> All right, let's get the rest of the stats for this wine. The 2019 Ventisquero Wine Estates Gray Glacier Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price is $25. It's the Region de Atacama, though it should qualify for the more specific Huasco Dio. The Longo Mia Vineyard, Block 22. Not sure what Block 22 is exactly, but maybe there's 22 blocks in this pretty small vineyard. 100% Sauvignon Blanc. The soil is sandy loam with calcareous mix. Yield is 5 to 6 tons per acre. It's hand harvested, cold maceration. Now this can be used interchangeably with fermentation for 6 to 8 hours. 6 to 8, not 68, from 6 to 8 hours. Aged on the lees for 10 months in 2,500 liter foudres. Batonage, so the lees, uh, this is stirring of the lees that, that occurred, though we don't know how often it happened. The age of potential, 5 to 10 years. The ABV is 13%, the pH is 3.34, the total acidity is 6.27, and the residual sugar is 1.46 grams per liter. Let's get into the wine. All righty now. So with all of these wines I've, I've done and the wines I'm doing, the next set of wines I'm doing, I needed to buy more of these Corvin screw cap caps. Um, yeah. Because almost all the wines in the series, I think all but two of the wines are um, screw caps. So that's six of the wines. And I only hit eight of these screw cap caps. And... Um, then I've got, I don't know, three or four more, four or five more um, wines on the next set of wines that I'm doing. Uh, that's going to be wines from Uruguay. I'm super excited about trying those. If all goes well, there should be a, there should be a, a, a review of cheese and wine between these two series. But I haven't gotten the cheese yet. And I'm recording all of the stuff like today. All right. Woo. There's like a little bit of smoky chalkiness to this. Yeah. Like, like the chalk got like finely ground and it's kind of in the air. It's kind of like that type of like aroma. It's like, it's like, it's like, a, it's like new construction is what it, it smells like. I mean, sure. I don't really get much anything else. Like I don't get really like any pepper or any, any of the citrus stuff I've been getting with all the wine so far. Let's just get into uh, the palate here. It's super good, but it's like really subtle. It's not hitting you in the face with anything. I get a greenness to it. It's more jalapeno than bell pepper, um, but it's kind of subtle. Um, I get a bit of orange and orange blossom here. I think it's like the first of the, all the wines I actually got any flower from. Though I do have three more I have to, even though this is the last wine in the series, I still have three more wines to actually review. I've uh, covered why in other episodes. Um, yeah, it's more of an orange thing. There's a minerality to it. Like, I haven't said this word really to the, on the other wines. There's kind of a chalkiness to it. Like if I was reviewing this, if I was blinding this wine, I am reviewing. If I was doing a blind on this, I said that that jalapeno greenness is really subtle. I would be hard pressed to identify the grape on this. Um, I would lean towards Sauvignon Blanc, but I would, I talked about this in one of the other episodes, you know, the triangle, the Bermuda triangle of wines with Gruner, Albarino, Pinot Grigio. And then I'll throw in Sauvignon Blanc sometimes because I, I feel like those might be some that just give me an out. This would be in that rectangle of death, <laughs> the square of death. Like, it's just like, I'd be like, what is this? Um, it's delicious. It tastes really good. With that said, I think there's an elegance and a complexity to the wine, which would 
a lot of times that triangle, we call it like all the neutrals. And while they can't have complexity within each of them, they tend to have a lot of neutrality to it. And there is, there's like this, it's a wine that I feel like I need to really sit down and think about. And we're not going to, I don't have time for that here. Um, but it's a wine that I would, I would drink over a long period of time and really reflect on it. Because I feel like there's these layers, like not literally onion in here, but like the layers of an onion that I need to peel off of this thing um, to really kind of analyze it. But with that said, so everything's like just super subtle. You've got a little bit of orange, you've got a little touch of jalapeno, you've got that chalkiness, that minerality. Um, you've got that white flower, the orange blossom. I feel like, and, and this didn't say anything, of, yeah, the, that's what it is, the, the batonnage. I feel like I, I feel like I'm getting that mouthfeel from the Lee stirring. That's what it is too. So with Lee's contact and Lee's stirring, then you get into other wines that this is more common with. So um, something like Chablis or with like Muscadet from the Loire Valley, uh, you get this mouthfeel and you get this complexity to it. And that's what I'm getting from this. Cause I was like, I feel like there's leaves stirring in this. Well, yeah, cause there is, cause it says on the tech sheet. So kudos to me for identifying Lee's contact. That's what it is. And it really gives me that almost oyster shell thing going on here. Like I would be, I, I could even say this could be Chablis. It, it's really, in, it's, it kind of plays in a lot of things. It's one of those things where it kind of, I wouldn't call it chameleon wine, but I think it it can fit in a lot of slots, we'll say, for it can be a substitute for a lot of other wines. Um, at some various price points too. Like I'm, 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 if I'm thinking Chablis on this, well, there are Chablis in this price point too. I'm not saying it's like compared to a Premier Cru or even a Grand Cru Chablis, but it feels like a high quality wine and is something where you could really use this for something else. If say you're a program at your restaurant, uh, you, you don't have one of those other wines, you need something else. There's a coolness factor to it because it is Chilean Sauvignon Blanc. It's super delicious. In many ways, it feels old world. I've talked about a lot of old worldness to this wine because I'm comparing it to the old world. And there's a lot of old world feel like winemaking happening here. A lot of attention to detail. Um, yeah. Now, what if I have food with this? So I talked about being a restaurant program. I would definitely pair this with, you know, like a pork dish. Uh, you could do like a pretty good, they say pretty good, but a chicken dish that's not like just grilled chicken, right? Something that's like a little bit higher in grilled chicken. You could even do it with like, say a breaded chicken because uh, you really have the acidity in here to cut, cut through it. It's like all the Sauvignon Blancs. Um, but you could do this with like, um, like Morton's had this like chicken, breaded chicken dish that was really good. I can see doing that. It had like a, like a creamy kind of sauce to it. Um, I mean, you could do like a chicken Parmesan, but I don't think like red sauce, I don't think Italian food would be a good pairing with this. Um, more of a French style, um, type of breaded chicken, um, pork. Also, you could do that uh, Get a breaded pork. I think, I think with that least with the, with the least contact, you're getting kind of that almost champagne like thing going on, um, flat champagne. <laughs> But you kind of get that champagne thing going on and fried food and champagne goes really well. It's normally because of the carbonation and the fried stuff, but there's still like a flavor thing going on. So I think you, you, you could really um, do something like that. Um, kind of artisan pizza. Uh, definitely some cheeses here you could do with. There's, um, I wouldn't do this as your first course type of thing, you know, the, uh, aperitif. I wouldn't do this with salads or anything like that. Um, also wouldn't do this as a porch pounder. This is, I mean, we're getting into that kind of more sophisticated level of wine that if you paired it with food, both would enhance. Like, I think the wine would open up more with food. I think it's, I think it's kind of the, the flavors are kind of trapped in there for right now. Now, 
I can have this wine later on tonight or three weeks from now, or with these caps, I can go up to three months. Actually, I've done five months before, but I can have this wine like a month or two from now. And it's not much taken out and it'll be perfectly preserved. And I could have a different experience with it. I could be like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? It was all subtle. It's all right there in your face. Today, at this moment in time, it's I think a lot of stuff is just trapped in there and not in a negative way. I don't think it was a poor, I don't think it's a bad winemaking. I think it's just, it's right there. It's recognizing talent. When you see somebody super talented in something and, and you, you hear it and you see it and, and you feel it and you're like, this person's going to go far. That's what I get with this wine. I feel like with some food in a different environment, not this like kind of analytical environment. If I was just relaxing and drinking the wine, I think it would shine absolutely shine i mean i can't be more complimentary than that you know and i get a little bit of sea quality seafood quality a little salinity to it i think it's well made all right as i took the last of the wine here all right so that's gonna do it for today's show if you enjoy what i'm doing here make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time with my empty glass